you just bow your head with me? Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts today. Lord, I just pray that you give us new life. Lord, put new life in this old life. Lord, fill these vessels, these jars of clay. Lord, fill us with life today. Lord, I come against the onslaught of this year. Lord, the fear, the worry, the doubt, the confusion, the lack. Lord, I bind that off of our hearts today. Lord, and I declare that the risen king is alive in us. Hallelujah. Lord, God, just ignite a fire in our hearts today. Lord, I pray that the spoken word becomes the rhema word that changes our hearts today. Lord, that you would do a work in us in your mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. So the last few weeks, we've been talking about weapons of victory. Everybody say weapons of victory. I hope you're having some more victory. We talked about the name of Jesus a few weeks ago. Last week, we talked about the anointing. We've talked about that you are the weapon. We've talked about the word of God, and all of these are weapons. And every single one of those that we've talked about, I've had the hardest time not saying that that's the greatest weapon there is. But today, I truly am going to reveal to us the last two on this list that I made a few weeks ago, and I would say they are the greatest weapons that we have available to us. And I feel like I can say that without reservation, not to discount any of the other ones, not to say that you don't need any of the other ones, but this first one we're going to talk about today is the resurrected Savior. Amen. Amen. Where would we be today? <laughs> uh, this is the, I, I hate to even use this word, I, word, I don't know what else to, to equate it to, but this is the Super Bowl of the church. Using the word Super Bowl nowadays, that kind of muddies the water for me. But anyway, because uh, the Cowboys aren't there. But anyway, so, uh, but the, th- this, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened on the planet. I mean, think about of all the things, of all the empires, the rising and falling, all these different things. Th- there, there is not a bigger event in history than Jesus coming back from the grave. I know you got a good job. I know, you know, you got a new car. I know some of you got new shoes today. You know, you're wearing your best of the best. But I got to remind you, there is nothing greater that has ever happened on this planet than Jesus Christ rose from the grave. Amen. That is the big, that, 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 you understand, we wouldn't be having church today if it wasn't for what happened 2,000 years ago. I mean, what, have you ever thought what, what your life would look like? What would your faith be without that? I'm sure somebody would still, you know, worship Jesus because he was a great prophet. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure someone would still have some kind of religion based around him because of, you know, the great things he said and did. But what, what makes it spectacular is that not only that he died, but that he rose again. Now, 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 I know I get excited when I think about that, but I got I to also remind you that is not even the biggest thing, that he rose again, even though it's huge. Because in the Bible, other people rose from the grave. He, he's not the only one. Even before Jesus, other people came back to life. The Shun- Elisha, he, he rose the, Sh- the Shunammite lady. Her, her son died, and he, he brought him back to life. Elijah, he, he, the, 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 Zarephath, the Zarephath lady, the widow of Zarephath, her, her son died, and, and Elijah brought him back to life. If you, if you study the Scripture, you, you know that, that Jesus is not the only one that came back to life, but it's almost as if history is setting us up. It's saying... It's possible. It's possible. You know, this person was died. They, they died of a flu, but they came back to life. This person, you know, this, this boy, his head started hurting, and he, he came back to life. And, and you go through Scripture, and, and, and then there, there, there's the story of the, what's one of my favorite stories of resurrection is 
These men are in a battle and they're, they're running for their lives and one of their comrades is wounded and, and as they're trying to escape, he, he dies on the way. And so they don't know what to do, so they, they see a cave and they, they take their fallen comrade and they, they put him inside of this cave and, and they continue on running because their, their enemy is still chasing them. And in just a matter of a few minutes, the, the guy they put, the dead guy they put in the cave catches up to them. Because the cave they put him in was Elijah's cave. It was, I mean, Elisha's cave. It, it's where Elisha's dead bones were. And somehow this body got up next to, to the power of God. And, and, he came, and so I, I just want to tell you that, that Jesus rose from the grave. It is, and I, I, I'm going to finish. I'm going to qualify this. But that is not what makes Resurrection Sunday spectacular. Because every other person that ever came back from the grave, Lazarus. Remember Lazarus, Jesus rose Lazarus. You know, he he, he was dead. I mean, you talk about a t-shirt. I was dead longer than Jesus. I mean, he he was dead four days. Jesus was barely dead three. I mean, it it said early on the third day. He he, he didn't wait until, I mean, three days, but but Lazarus was dead four. But every one of these people that died in in the Bible, Old and New Testament, every single one of them, they also have something else in common. They died again. (laughs) And this is what makes it special. Because Jesus, not only did he come back from the grave, but he never died again. Oh, my, my. Let, me, let me just let that soak into me. I, you don't see, I don't know if you get, let me, let me give you a verse. It's John chapter 14, verse 19. It says, because, this is Jesus talking. He says, because I live, you can live also. Hallelujah. That, that because he, lives, I, feel, I feel like I'm, I'm talking at the wrong church. Be, because he's alive, you can live also. Thank you. That, that side's getting it. Let me, let me go over here and help you all. Because he's alive, you get to live also. Now we got a competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys that are listening at home, maybe you don't want to make a big scene because somebody else hadn't got out of bed yet or somebody's making coffee, but you not, you not just need to shout a little bit and say, because he lives, I'm living too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. This is in almost every funeral I ever, I've ever had the opportunity to share at. This comes up just in any time I'm putting notes together in funerals. But listen to this, 1 Corinthians 15. This is a little lengthy, but hang in there. Verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh, flesh and blood, you're, everybody pinch yourself, don't, don't get crazy, but... Say this and kind of hold your skin up a little bit. Some of you are a little older, you can kind of hold your, anyway. That's a whole other, yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that visual. Yeah. Now, (laughs) sorry, I got to get back from that. Now this, brethren, I say that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, your skin can't go to heaven. Hang with me. Behold. I show you a mystery. Do y'all like mysteries? Don't you love it when like something you never knew, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I didn't know that. Anyway, he's going to show us something. He says, I will show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. You could take that word and put the word die in there. We shall not all die. We shall not all sleep. He, he just, he, he's prettifying it for the, the PG-13 group, group. So we shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost on that. I believe God is going to change some of us today. I believe a lot of the dead ways, a lot of the flesh ways inside of us, I believe God is going to change us today. If you're, if you're taking notes, you might want to write down, change me. Verse 52, he's going to tell you how you're going to change. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, it'll be, if you didn't know, it's going to be Johnny. I got it figured out now. 
Johnny used to play the, the, the sax here. He's going to be, anyway, missed him today. We, we had a spider incident in the drum booth. If y'all didn't get here before church, you missed it. You know, poor Chris is in there running around like a crazy person. No, it wasn't bad. <laughs> so, and Johnny's our spider getter. But anyway, Johnny went to heaven. He's taking care of it up there. But anyway, I, I digress. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we, everybody say we, we, talking about us that are still here, and we shall be, here it is again, changed. Hallelujah. And then he explains it. He says, for this corruptible, this skin, this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortality, this mortal, must put on immortality. Because Remember, because your skin can't go to heaven. So you have to die to get there. You have to be changed. You have to have some metamorphosis happen in you. And that's what he's describing to us. That's the mystery. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, and it was written about Jesus, death is swallowed up in victory. Woo! Death, let me say this again. Death is swallowed up in victory. Your greatest victory is not, is not getting a problem to quit chasing you. Your greatest victory is to have death over the problem. That, 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 your greatest victory is for that gossiper not to quit gossiping about you. It's for you to die, and now it has no effect on you. Mm-hmm. Come on. Your greatest victory is not that you quit drinking and you're going to NA and AA and all that stuff. That's, that, that's, an, that's, an, that's an accomplishment. But your greatest victory is that your flesh has died and now the, de- the drunk man is dead and now you are immortal and you're living without the, the, the desire. Are you with me? So let, I, I still not even finished. It says, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, oh, death. Where is thy sting? <laughs> I, I love the way that's written. I just love, I don't think this, I think this is the ESV, the King James. It might be the King James because I love the way, some of the poetic way they say, this is the King James. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And then he says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through, everybody say through, through. I'm setting you up, we're laying some foundation, through, say through, through, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, through, we, all of this happens through the Lord Jesus Christ. When, 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 and, and I pray that you get there. I pray, I pray that, that somehow in your life you get, you get to the realization that the greatest victory in your life is when you die. I know. I feel like I'm preaching a funeral right now. I was at a funeral once, and this preacher was preaching. And he was talking, and he was talking about, this guy ain't even here, and he shook him. in the, had an open coffin during the, the funeral, and he shook. He got a, I put his hand on his chest, and he said, this guy is not here, but he has the greatest victory of anyone in the whole house because he has gone to glory. The mortality, the mortal, has changed to immortality. Now, now. I would never do that because that's just a little, that was freaking me out, okay? But anyway, but it would have been so cool if, if the dude had come back to life right then. That would have been, <laughs> that would have messed everybody up. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, God is here today not to just remind you that he lives, that he resurrected, but to resurrect the dead things in you. He's here today to resurrect those dreams, those those visions, the things that were stolen, the calling on your life when you were a little kid, the things that you know God was going to do in your life, and and this happened and that happened. He's here today to resurrect. He's here today to give you a fresh start, a a new beginning. That's what Easter is about. 
And the great weapon we have and we're talking about right now is that he came back to life and never died again. Just, just for your, to think about, the, there, there is religions that have a cross and they worship the cross, but it still has Jesus on the cross. There's many people that are, that are going to church yesterday and today and, and the Jesus they see is still on the cross. That is not the truth of the gospel. It's where he was, and it's what happened. But if we want to wear something around our neck, what we should wear is a rock with a hole in it that signifies the tomb is empty. He who was dead is alive forevermore. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I truly believe as we go through today that God is here to resurrect the dead things in your life. Hallelujah. So that's, I wish I had more time, but that's the first of these two I want to talk to you about today. So the first of the greatest weapons in the arsenal that you have is that Jesus rose from the grave. Let, let, I need to go on, but let, let, me, let me say this. Some people don't believe that he rose from the grave. You know, some people say, well, well yeah, I, you know, I mean, because you can't, you can't, unless you're just a complete I don't even, I don't want to use bad language, but you can't, you can't say that Jesus didn't live. He was a historical figure. There, there is evidence that there was a man named Jesus. Now, you can maybe discount all the stories, and you maybe could even discount that he rose from the grave. You, you can't discount that he died on a cross because it's historical evidence. But you may be able to talk yourself out of well, you know, you, you might agree with, with, the, with the, the, the scribes of the day that said, well, Jesus' body was stolen. That the disciples came and they somehow overpowered the guards and they somehow moved this stone out of the way. But to even believe that, you have to then believe that the disciples who were in hiding because they thought they were going to die, all of a sudden got back together and moved the stone and snuck off with the body of Jesus and put him in an unmarked grave and then put the stone back and, and then had a light come out that scared the... Anyway, it, it, it's a long shot. But let's just say that, that that's what you believe, that somehow this thing was just all made up, that, yeah, there was a guy named Jesus, and yeah, he died, but I don't believe he rose from the grave. I, I want you to think about you and your best two friends. Let's say you have two wonderful friends, and you and these two friends have decided to cover up a lie. Let's say maybe you, ro you robbed you know, somebody, and you stole something, or something. Or, or maybe let's just say that you've told people that you pastor a church or something, and, and so you've got this lie, and you've got your two buddies that are going to help you keep this lie going for years. And years. And then one day, the soldiers come, and they get one of your buddies, and they say, you tell the truth or we're going to kill you. Which one of your friends is going to cave first? Come on. One of your friends is going to give you up. At the point of death, probably both of them will give you up. Matter of fact, if it's a lie, and they tell you, we're going to put you in a burning pot of, of hot oil and we're going to boil you alive unless you tell the truth. Most of us would come clean. I would dare say all of us would. So to discount that Jesus came back from the grave would mean you don't just have two friends, but you have ten. One of the twelve disciples killed himself. One of them hung himself because of what he, do, he did, had done to Jesus. The other 11 were all mur martyred, or 10 of them were martyred for what they believed. For, for what you would have to say, if you don't believe Jesus rose from the grave, you would have to say these 11 people were martyred for a lie. All 11 of them, it's kind of 11, maybe it's really more 10, because one of them, they tried to kill him, John, and they couldn't. Historically, they say they tried to, they beat him, 
and tried to burn him at the stake, but the fire kept going out. So they took John and they put him in a hot boiling pot of oil and tried to boil him alive and he wouldn't die. So they put him on a ship and put him on an island called Patmos to maroon him and get him away from everybody so that everybody wouldn't hear this crazy lunatic story that Jesus came back from the grave. The other disciples, they killed them in in horrific deaths. One of them was crucified upside down. You're telling me he did that for a lie? I don't think so. Your best friend wouldn't lie for you that long. And if you have 10 or 11 friends, I can promise you, they're not going to lie all the way to the burning hot pot of oil. I can assure you. And then they put John on this island thinking we're going to shut him up forever. But John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he writes the book, the last book of your Bible called The Revelation of of Jesus the Christ. And he tells in detail of his death, burial, and resurrection. You can't convince me now that that, that Jesus didn't come back from the grave. He didn't just come back and poof and go to heaven. He came back from the grave and he walked around and hundreds of people saw him. He came to dinner parties. He ate dinner with them and then went right back through the wall and didn't even open the door because that's just the way he is. He is the greatest king ever and he is my weapon of victory. Hallelujah. Second weapon today. This is my favorite one. The blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus. The the blood, I I did a little research and I I discovered a few things about the blood of Jesus that I want, or just blood in general that I want to share with you. Blood is a transportation system in your body. It is the way oxygen moves around. It is the way hormones, electrolytes, all of the things that make you alive, it is, it, blood is really just taking it from here and putting it here and then picking it up here and taking it from there. When, when, when the oxygen gets into your lungs, your blood picks it up and it runs it up to your brain so you can keep on thinking. And it runs it down into your heart and, and it takes it all the way down to your teeny tiny little toes. And then it comes back around and, and about the time it gets to your fingers and your toes, the, the oxygen is gone. And so what happens is the blood transports these blood cells back up to the lungs to get more oxygen and it does this all the time it's it's this transportation system taking the glucose and the 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 mineral ions and all all the things in us and it moves it all around inside of us you could say this of your blood it is the life source if your blood starts moving you start dying amen in this process of the blood moving throughout your body. If, you're, if you have a healthy system, what happens is it, it purifies you. It takes the, 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 the carbon dioxide and it, it helps you expel it so that, so that the good stuff can come. It takes the, 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 the food you ate and it, it's looking for the good nutrients and the vitamins and, and it has to sort through the glazed donut. Sometimes in my, the little guys in my body are like, you got nothing for us here. <laughs> but it transports the good and it, it, brings, it brings the good and it, it transports the bad. It's, it's this transportation system that is designed to purify your entire body. When we begin to get sick, then what happens is it's because the blood is not working the way it should. But it's the same way spiritually. The blood of Jesus is inside of this room today. It's in our hearts today. It, it, is, it is around us to purify us. It brings us the word of God, and it takes out the stuff that's not the word. And we don't know where all that came from, but anyway. And it, it's going through, and it's taking out the bad air, and it's bringing in the good air. And it does this all the time. It's, it's, it's the blood, everybody say the blood of Jesus. Now, I grew up in church, and so I grew up, you know, singing about the blood and, you know, hearing about the blood and, 
you know, talking about the blood. It was just, it was just a part of life. But, but I, 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 sometimes I feel like I can kind of, kind of put myself in the seat of somebody that, that they've never been to church, and they show up one Sunday morning, and the preacher's talking about blood, and they're thinking, "What in the world is going on in here? I'm in a cannibal thing. Something's happening." And and then they give me this thing of grape juice and tell me, "Drink it. It's the blood of Jesus." And I'm like, "I'm not drinking y'all's Kool-Aid. I am out of here." It's, we, we, you know, the, the same people that will, will be at church, the same, you know, you know old-time Pentecost people that will that'll go to church and sing the songs about the blood of Jesus. You put on a graphic TV show, and one person gets shot, and there's a little puddle of blood. They're like, oh, I can't watch that. That's just too graphic. I got news for you. The blood of Jesus is extremely graphic. It is extremely bloody, but it, it's for a purpose, and it's to, to purify us. Amen? Amen. People say, well, it's just, just so graphic. Y'all talking about the blood all the time, and all this blood talk and all, but, the, but there's a reason. There's a reason we talk about it. We, 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 we probably won't watch one of those movies of, you know, blood getting splattered everywhere. And, and if your kids have got the video games that, you know, has the, I don't know what, the, what they rate them now, but, you know, with the graphic content, you know, and, and all the, you know, they shoot somebody. And I, I'm, I grew up in gun smoke, you know. Somebody got shot, you know, you know, rifle man or something, you know, and he takes somebody down, and they're, oh. And they twitch on the ground. Some of y'all remember, some of y'all old as me, yeah. And not a drop of blood anywhere, right? Because, you see, they had to clean that up for television. And, and that what's happened in our world today, in Christianity today, is we have cleaned up. We've cleaned up this blood mess. We don't talk about it like we should. We, we want to avoid it because the unchurched, it might cause them to be repulsed. It might cause them to be like, oh, I don't, I, that's just too messy. And in the process of that, we have denied the power of the cross. You see, in the, in the physical, your blood, not only is it transporting things, but it also carries a message. Your DNA, who you are, is in your blood. Whether you're sick or healthy, it's told, it, it speaks. Let's put it that way. Your blood speaks. Your blood tells a story. Your blood has something to say. You've been to the doctor sometimes and they'll say, we need to see what's going on inside of you, so go get some blood work done. Right? What they're saying is, let, let, let's see what your blood has to say. They'll send you to, to get the CBC. Have you ever heard that? The CBC. And what the CB is, CBC is complete blood count. In other words, they're going to they're gonna poke a needle in you and they're going to take a little bit of blood and, and they're going to they're put that blood on a microscope and they're going to look at it and it's going to tell them so many things because your blood, tell that person next to you, say, my blood's talking. See, your, your blood has a story to tell. And so they look at your blood under the microscope and they can tell what you've been eating. They can tell, you know, but by the blood count if you have an infection in your body. They can tell if you have cancer. Your, your blood tells a story. It, they evaluate your health. They, they diagnose a health problem. They, they monitor your health with it. They, they monitor the treatment that they give you. They put you on a new medication. And then you go back and you got to get more blood work. you got to see what the blood is saying now because your blood is always telling a story. And in the spiritual, in the spiritual thing, it's the same, re it's the same way. Your blood tells a story about you. You see, this is, why, this is why the blood is so important. This is why we can't discount. We can't just write it off and, oh, it's, you know, let's just talk about, you know, let's just talk about healing. Let's just talk about miracles. We, we don't want to talk about the blood because it's too, it's too uncomfortable. You might, you might make people uncomfortable. But you see, if you go back in, in Scripture to the book of Genesis, 
There's a story of the very first two sons born, Adam and Eve. They had two boys, and one of them's name is, do you know, Cain. The other one's name is Abel. And here's how to help you remember who killed who. is Cain took his cane and killed his brother. Except it wasn't a cane, it was a rock. So Cain, we have this story of, and I don't want to get into all the why. You can read it. It's, it's in Genesis chapter 4. I mean, the, 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 the story of creation. I mean, we're just Genesis chapter 4. This, there's, only, there's only four people on earth, and one of them kills another one. So we're early into this thing, right? But God, God shows us something that is so, it's so telling about the blood of Jesus because what happens is Cain kills his brother Abel, And then we have these words in Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord says to Cain, the murderer, he says, where is Abel, your brother? Cain says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You've heard that, right? And if you keep reading, and then the Lord said, what have you done? Speaking to Cain. And here it is. The voice, everybody say the voice. The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. The voice of your brother's blood. Your your blood is speaking today. Your blood is telling a story. It tells of the things you put in you. By choice, and it tells of the things done to you without your consent. Your blood tells of every bit of abuse. I'm talking about your spiritual blood, the blood that that flows through your spiritual man. That blood tells us, if, if Abel's blood is crying out to God and saying, I've been murdered, will you vindicate me? Will you justify me? What is your blood saying today? The abuse that you've gone through. The things that nobody knows. The uncles that abused you and raped you and maligned you. The ones that stole from you. The ones that... And then the secrets that we keep ourselves. The times we look back and we we wish we could make that go away. but, But there it is. You see, your enemy... Your enemy is always saying things about you. He's saying that you're forgotten, that you're abused. He, he looks you in the eye sometimes. Maybe, maybe you don't realize it, but it's the thing that makes you feel worthless. That tack broke. Makes you feel like you're a failure. He tells you that you're orphaned, that you're wounded. Nobody cares about you. No one's going to help you. The enemy is always speaking your blood. The blood of your past is saying that you're abandoned. Says that you're broken. It's just constantly going at you all the time. It's when you wake up in the morning, you you, you don't maybe hear the word, but the blood inside of you is telling a story that you're never going to change. Says that you're carnal. Says you're just a complainer. You're stingy. Some of you, this, this, one, this one won't seem to let you go. It just says you're a drug addict. You're fearful. Your blood is in, inside of you today, and it's, it's saying all these terrible things. You're lazy. You're bitter. Maybe sometimes God, maybe sometimes the devil just gets really in your face and he tells you you're just a homosexual, you're a drunk, you're a liar. He's just constantly speaking through your past. An adulterer, a murderer. I'm sorry if I'm taking some time, but I know God's speaking to some of your hearts. You're envious. You're a gossiper. You're a thief. You're lustful. 
You're a cheater. You're running out of space. You're troubled. This is for somebody. You're just too much. Prideful. Stay up here all day and just remind you of what your blood says. You know, and here we are on Easter Sunday, and Easter is the Sunday that we all somehow make it to church. We've all got our showers, and we're put on our Sunday best. Your Sunday best only hides what's on the inside. Your Sunday best only, all it does is it just covers. It just covers what your blood says. Your Sunday best is just a costume on the outside. It's just a thing that hides who you really are. It hides all the things that the enemy has spoken about you and said to you. You know, just this last year and a half, the things that are on my shirt is things that I've dealt with. Many of those have been said from people to me directly. Because you see, the enemy wants to destroy you. And he wants you to take your blood as the final word. He wants, he, want, he wants what he says about you to be the end. You see, if, if Jesus died and his blood just went into the ground, it would still break the curse of Abel, of the murder. But he didn't stop there. Everybody say, everybody say through his blood. Through, this, is, this is a common, it comes up in Scripture over and over. It, it, you'll read in the Scripture and it says, and this happened through his blood. And, and when you read that, you could, you could read it as because of his blood. But I, 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 I want you to say it again. Say through his blood. See, not, not as, as this happened, Jesus did this, and because of his blood, now this happens. It's through in other words, you have to go through the blood. I know it's a play on words, but I think it's extremely important. Let me give you a couple examples. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. You see, it, you, can't, you can't just come to church and hear them talk about the blood and, and try to not get any on you. You have to go through the blood. You can't just say, well, those church people, you know, they're a little bit crazy. No, if you're, if you're going to experience what God has for you, if, if you're going to let him do a blood transfusion and remove the junk from your blood, that means you've got to get into his blood. You've got to go through his blood. I, 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 I'm not just going to rub up next. A lot, a lot of Christians are, are just playing church, and, and we just show up here, and, and we show up there, and, and we just be a part here. And, and, but, but we don't really want to get the blood on us because we don't want to get dirty. And we don't want to have to have to handle all of all the well. If he did die, then I got to change, and I'm not sure I want to change. And so what happens is we just we we just go up to because of the blood, but we don't want to go through the blood. Look what look what Colossians chapter one verse twenty. Having made peace, here it is again. Through we we want peace. Let me, let me read it. And having made peace. Through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. We, 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 we want to have peace with God. We, we, we want to be right with God. I got, I got news for you, though. If you're going to be right with God, you got to go through the blood. <laughs> you have to take the blood and apply it to you. In the Old Testament, the, the death angel's coming. It's the last plague of Egypt. The death angel's on the way. And as the death angel is going through the streets, what kept the death angel from coming through the door 
was the blood on the door. You can't just say, well, I'm going to put blood on my neighbor's door. And, and Pastor Gary's praying. He's got blood on his door. And, and, and Shanda's praying. And, and Ruth is praying. And, and we, got, we got blood all over the neighborhood. Why do I need blood? Because it don't work that way. You can't just have the blood down the street. You got to have the blood over your heart. You got to have the blood of Jesus inside of you or you're nothing. Hallelujah had all kinds of notes about that, and I took it out because I, I didn't think I was going to go there. But let me just take a minute. On that day that, they, that the, the angels coming, they had to get up in that morning, and they had to kill a sheep. They had to take a lamb, a little lamb chop, and had to kill a cute little lamb. You see, if you're going to have victory in your life, it's going to cost you something. If you think I'm just going to come to church and church is free and I don't hate, it's not going to cost, it's going to cost you something because it cost him everything. So we should expect that we're going to have to pay something. Amen. Nothing is free in this world. Hello, I'm getting a little, getting a little worked up. So they took this little lamb and they. They had to cut its throat. They had to pour out its blood in a vessel. They had to capture it. Picture that you're a 12-year-old adolescent. This is the first time this has ever happened. let's, Let's go for some of the girls. You're 14. And dad says to you, we're going to kill your sheep. And you're like, I, I, you ain't killing my sheep. I raised this little cute little. It, can you imagine the teenagers in town rising up and saying, uh, "Call PETA, call somebody. We we gotta protect the sheep." <laughs> Look at the graphic nature of this. They. The family is all there. They have to gather as a family. They have to all witness the cutting of the sheep's neck, of the capturing of the blood. And then they have to go out on their doorstep, and they have to get a a, a branch of hyssop, and they put it in like a paintbrush, and they paint the blood over their... Blood is dripping everywhere. It's running down daddy's arm as it's coming down that branch of hyssop. It's getting in his clothes. The kids are standing around... It looks like a massacre has happened. Y'all remember last Christmas? Last Christmas, there was this thing, you know, we were all deep in COVID-19, and there was this thing going on about the blood on your doorpost, and and people were putting red lights and ribbons. Y'all remember that just a few months ago? And then people are writing in, my neighbors are complaining because I got my red lights on my... You can put a Santa Claus up, and nobody's got a problem, but you get to messing with the blood because there's power in the blood. There's redemption in the blood, and you get to messing with it, and the devil don't like it because it reminds him of the blood that was spelt on Calvary and how that blood told a story. Hallelujah. Mm. You got to get his blood on you. You got you to be covered in his blood. You see, because the blood of Jesus, if blood has a voice, come on, if blood has a voice, uh, some of y'all, y'all, now you hear that, come on, Gary, come on, get there. Come on, come on. Are you with me? If blood has a voice, woo, there was every drop of blood spelled at Calvary. It started on the day before when they started whipping him and they started beating him. And the Bible says that by his stripes, through his, come on somebody, through his stripes, we were healed. That was a graphic A graphic explosion of blood as that Roman centurion takes that whip on his back. If you're standing in the crowd as a bystander, you're probably going to get a little blood on you. If you don't want some blood on you, don't show up at church. If you don't want to be around, if you don't want some blood on you, you better not get in there, Jesus, because his blood is being spewed for everyone because it tells a story. Hallelujah. It has something. Something to say. Look at look at Hebrews. Oh, this is my new favorite verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Everybody say a new covenant. 
Woo, come on, we need a new covenant. You see, covenant talks about blood. Let me take a second. Covenant talks about blood. Covenant's all about blood. You can't have a covenant without some blood being shed. And and we've all made a covenant with the devil. We were born in sin. And because of that covenant with him, because of what Adam and Eve did, because of that covenant, before you were ever born, your blood says you're not going to make it. Your blood tells a story and says you're worthless. Your blood tells a story. Excuse me. It says, that you're, it says all these things and even more about you. But oh my goodness, there's somebody say a new covenant. Hebrews 12, 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks. <laughs> Woo, let that soak in a minute. That speaks a better word mm, than the blood of Abel. It speaks a better word. Oh, you see, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word about you. The blood of Jesus says things like this. It says they're set free. Hallelujah. It says they're delivered. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The blood of Jesus, it speaks things that you didn't even know could be said about you. It says that you're faithful. Oh, somebody's faithful in this house. It says that you're healed. Is anybody in this house getting healed right now? The, the blood of Jesus has, it has something. Oh, you, you see, you see when, they, when they cut his back open and they thought we're going to kill him, what they didn't know was that all of a sudden the blood of Jesus began to speak. And as he's, as he's going through that process and as he's being wounded, as he's being purposed, as, as he's being stabbed and broken, it, it's to make us whole. As, 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 as it seems like everybody around him is turning their back on him, he declares that he is trustworthy and that makes you trustworthy. He says that you're honorable. Oh, come on, somebody. I wish somebody in this house would get excited. He says that you're bold. He said, oh, this is a good one. I love this is for somebody. He says that you're clean. Let me get that out of the way. He says that you're clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let that, that soak in. Let that just soak in. Not clean because I got a bath. Because I, I don't know if you figured it out yet, but you're going to need another one. <laughs> Let me help somebody. I don't know who you are, but I'll sniff you out. You you had a bath, but you're going to need another one. But when you're clean by the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, you are clean indeed. You are loyal, hallelujah. Oh, my God. Oh, here's a good one. Fearless. Woo, hallelujah. When you've come face to face with death, anybody ever almost died? You see, when, when you come face to face with death and you realize that if I was to die, I would go to heaven, then the devil has nothing on you. And then, then oh, we got all these people, these slogans, living my best life. You want to live your best life? Be ready to die. Because then the devil can't mess with you. Oh, you want, you going to mess with my electric bill? I may not pay my electricity. Big whoopee doo. You can kill me and I go to heaven. Come on, uh, uh, let me get back to it. Content, content. This is what the blood says about you. It says you're, this is for somebody because there's somebody in this room that you're so anxious, you're always wanting to go. You always got to run. You, got, you, you can't settle down. You, you're just always discontented with everything. You're never grateful. Here's another one, humble. Man, we need to have some humble people in this place. Gentle, oh my goodness, some of y'all ne- never been told that you're gentle, but God says that about you. He says you're gentle. Oh, hallelujah, joyful, patient. Oh my goodness, I got a bunch of these. Patient, there's another one that you're, fa- oh, this is a good one. Look at this one. Let the lost be found. Anybody been found in this house? Anybody ever had God find you? Hallelujah. And the great thing is when he finds you, he doesn't leave you the way you were. Anybody ever been forgiven? Woo, hallelujah, forgiven, hallelujah. Here's another one, redeemed, redeemed. What's the verse say? Through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Get, get a hold of your communion while you can see, while you can find it there. I'm not finished, but I'm, I'm almost done. You don't have to open it, but just get a hold of it. You see, his, his blood 
speaks a better word. (sighs) Let that soak in for a minute. Lord, I thank you that I'm not what others have said. Lord, because your blood speaks a better word. I told y'all not to open that, and I can hear y'all opening it. (laughs) Do we need to back up and put disobedient up there? (laughs) Y'all just jumping the gun. The blood of Jesus. I grew up, I grew up with the idea, I don't know where I got the idea, but when you do something wrong as a kid, you deal with that shame, and shame makes you feel dirty. And somehow growing up, I had the idea that my my heart was was black. You know, I was like six. I don't know what I could have done. And I remember, you know, finding Jesus at an early age and, and just feeling dirty before him. And just feel like just this blackness in me. And so as I grew up, I, I had this, this revelation later in life that, that my sin isn't black. But that's what my sinful blood told me. There's this amazing verse. It's life-changing for me when I found this. I, I, before I read this, I, I want you to focus on a few of those, those words in black that, that really speak to you. Just pick out one or two of those and just focus on that as, as I read this next verse. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. He says, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though our sins are like scarlet. You see, because when you're, when, you're, when you're covered in the blood, <laughs> it changes everything. When you're, when you're covered in the blood when, when, when the blood, when you let the blood get on you, oh, it changes. It changes everything. All the things that the devil said about you, they just disappear in the blood. Take, take your cup there, your communion cup. Now you can go ahead and open it. Some of you are ahead of the game. Get that little wafer out and hold it. If you're hungry, I'll just tell you this is not going to help. Two thousand some years ago, on a on a on a Thursday, the disciples all gathered together with Jesus. They didn't know at the time that it would be called the Last Supper. They didn't know when they went in that upper room that it would become one of the most famous paintings ever painted. All they knew was their friend Jesus had called them together. And as they gathered and they had a meal, he had been trying to set them up and trying to tell them that that he was about to die and They didn't understand that. It wasn't information they wanted to hear. And as the evening went on, he picked up a piece of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. How perplexing that must have been for them. I mean, Jesus was notorious for saying stuff out of the blue and and them not really understanding it. This was one of those moments. At least they kept their mouth shut. Because a lot of times they would ask questions at the wrong time, it seemed like. But they just sat there and they took that piece of bread that he gave them. 
And he said, take this and eat this. It's my body. Would you stand up with me? Let's just stand in reverence. But I want you to picture them as they're kind of looking around. What, what are we doing? James looks at John and what is that? What is that? His body? This is bread. You see the, the bread though back then? The bread looked more like a cracker. It was thin. And it had holes in it from the process of baking it. From the grilling process of this bread being browned on, it had stripes on it. It's no wonder that the prophet had written of him. And it said that he is bruised and broken for us. And by his stripes, we were healed. He was pierced for our transgression. His body for us. And he hands them that bread and they begin to eat it. And then he takes some wine and he pours it in a cup. Remember the the very first thing they ever saw him do was take water and turn it into wine. And now he holds up a goblet and he says to them, after they've watched wine be poured into it, and he says, this is blood. This is my blood of the covenant poured out for you. Drink it. You see, you can't can't be a Christian and avoid the blood. It's everything. Lord, we stand before you today. Bow your heads. Let's pray. We stand before you today. We hold this little wafer that signifies your body. Lord, and as we take and eat this, let us never forget the price you paid. Let us never forget that your blood is speaking to us. Lord, let us us never forget the stripes on your back, the, the nails in your hands and feet, the spear that was thrust in your side. Lord, let us never forget. Go ahead and take and eat that wafer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your body. Spend a minute and just say thank you, Lord. Come on, let it settle down in you. The price he paid. Get your cup and hold it in your hand. Put yourself at the table that evening. The man you love, the one that you've seen open blind eyes, the one that you have seen raise Lazarus and others from the grave, he stands in front of us and he says, in this goblet, in this cup, is my blood. And you very well could have imagined if you stood there having watched him turn water into into wine, you could definitely imagine that he might have turned this wine into blood. But whether he did or not is irrelevant because it represents the cross that's about to happen. And so he tells them, take a drink, and they begin to pass the cup around. And you can imagine how you'd want to peek in, how you would look at the guy next to you who just drank it and and how uneasy that would make you. But they all followed in obedience. And so will we. Lord, we thank you today for your blood. Don't drink it yet. Lord, we thank you today for this wine, this grape juice that signifies your blood. Lord, and we pray today that as we drink this, that it'll speak a new word over us. (laughs) Lord, speak a new word over us. I don't know who's in this room today that needs to hear a new word, but God is speaking a new word over you. Lord, speak a new word over us today. Lord, that you would speak a new word over us. Hallelujah. Go ahead and take that drink. Oh, Lord, we declare 
we declare that we're forgiven, that we're redeemed. So we break off the assignment of the enemy and the things he's spoken about us. We bind those words in Jesus' name. Lord, we bind those curses in Jesus' name. Lord, and we declare that we are who you've said we are. Lord, we thank you, God, that we are, we are more than what we think, God. We, we, were, we are more than what our blood says. Lord, as we stand in the blood of Jesus, Lord, we're what you say. Today, before we go, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never made your mind up to follow him, maybe you've come to church a few times, but you've never made your mind up to follow him, right there where you are, just say to him, God, I'm going to follow you today. Come on, make a prayer today. As we stand here in the blood of Jesus, make a prayer today and say, I choose today to follow you. I'm going to turn my back on my old ways. I'm going to turn my back on my past. And I'm going to go after you, God. I'm going to follow after you. Hallelujah. I don't know what it's going to look like, Lord. I don't know where you're going to lead me. Lord, I'm going to go through the blood. More than I deserve.